Hello and welcome to the first iteration of Matthew's Integrated Pest Management Frequently Asked Questions series, where I answer questions from my various followers on various social media platforms like Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. And I've had the opportunity to make a lot of professional and even personal friends on these various platforms. And whether they are or are not those people, I'm very interested in getting these questions so that I can field them to other people. I'm a big advocate of the free exchange of knowledge, and a lot of times people that I meet on these social media platforms have a lot of questions, hence the work that I do and a lot of the contents that I make. So I started this series to sort of help with that. Answering people's questions and being a reference to other people gives me great fulfillment and it's important to me that this knowledge reaches as many people as possible. The first question I received from the Kush Ghost on Instagram is, is leaving spiders on your plants when growing outdoors good for IPM? I would say briefly that yes, I think facilitating spiders in your agricultural or sort of garden uh, situation is not a bad idea. Spiders are generalists, but not all of them spin webs like orb weavers do. Um, jumping spiders are a good example of a solitary hunter that doesn't use a web to hunt in the same way that uh, silk orb weavers do. There are also crab spiders that are ambushed predators as well. And because they're generalists, that means that they might go after some pest species like certain moths and beetles and that sort of a thing. However, they will probably not do very well against or really have any effect on the sort of smaller pests that tend to be much more pernicious and pestiferous. Your various russet mites, your broad mites, your white flies, maybe, a, well, maybe they might be affected a little bit. But your thrips and your spider mites and that sort of a thing, they reproduce so vastly and they can travel such far distances, I wouldn't consider them to be a hard counter to um, these pests. But facilitating spiders can have a lot of sort of ecological benefit to the environment that you're growing in, and they can have some effect on um, both beneficial organisms and detrimental organisms. They will feed on honeybees sometimes, and they'll probably catch a couple of hoverflies and lace wings and that sort of a thing too. So you should be aware of that when considering them in your IPM context. Max Moon on Instagram asks, what are the most concerning contemporary pathogens in cannabis and hemp? You know, I've gotten a lot of interesting questions and comments from Max Moon, and I appreciate this one as well because I think that they understand that I quite like to talk about this subject. So I interpret the word contemporary to mean sort of um, either confirmed or discovered recently in uh, cannabis particularly. There are three main pathogens I'd like to talk about. The first are phytoplasmas, in particular hemp phytoplasmas, which do not have a cell wall like other bacteria do, and they are quite small. In fact, they have a triple layered membrane instead of a cell wall. And crucially, they colonize the phloem channels of plants. They are extremely difficult to study and culture, which has made uh, research and even the detection of phytoplasmas um, difficult. They are a problem in very many different kinds of plants, and indeed they have phytoplasmas um, that affect cannabis as well. Those species can be few and far between, um, and they have different sort of relationships with each other. I've noticed that various phytoplasma species, um, some of which aren't even confirmed to be species, are still in the candidatus um, category, which is what we give to organisms that are not um, uh, confirmed, for lack of a better term. Phytoplasmas uh, cause stunting and yellowing in various plants, and they can often be lethal. And in cannabis, it's no different. They can be found in the USA. There are records of hemp phytoplasmas in the US, as well as central China, India, 
and probably other parts of Eurasia for that matter. The two other ones I wanted to talk about were Lettuclerosis virus and Feet Curly Top virus. Lettuclerosis virus is already well known in agriculture. It causes problems in lettuce, but also many other plants. Yellowing, stunting, often lethal. It causes millions of dollars of damage. It is a creamy virus, and creamy viruses are thought to originate in uh, southwestern uh, North America. Interestingly, they were found to be vectored by the silverleaf white fly in Israel in the authorized farm. So, to have a virus that is thought to originate in southwestern uh, California, essentially, move all the way up to Israel and infect a totally new plant species is sort of worrying and concerning. And the silverleaf white fly is a super vector of over 180 plant viruses, so I am very concerned about the silverleaf white fly becoming a big problem in cannabis generally, as well as for other plants as well. Finally, we have the bee curly top virus, which is also well known in the agricultural sphere. It is very pernicious and is found in many, many, many crops, but the beets are hit the most. They're found in parts of uh, Europe and uh, various other parts of Eurasia, Africa, North America, and I believe that it was confirmed in Central North America, specifically Colorado, in uh, 2019. So they were, it was found in a crop where the symptoms were known for a few years earlier, so it was probably in the area for quite a while. And bee curly top virus is significant because it is vectored by Securilifer uh, tenilis, the bee leafhopper. There are other species in the genus Circulifer, but this is the bee hopper that is known most uh, prominently to vector the pathogen. Another problem with bee curly top virus is that it does infect an awful lot of other plants, just like Lesclerosis virus. So in both cases, it's possible that other agricultural crops and even some asymptomatic plants can be vectors for the virus, and the beet leafhopper need only move from its local ecosystem to uh, some plant that has the virus, become viriliferous itself, and then move into a cannabis crop or some other crop and then cause damage there and then move back as the uh, seasonality of its migration dictates. Grown in Elsinore asks on Instagram, what's your opinion on using Ampelomyces quequalis to prevent powdery mildew on cannabis? This is a great question because this particular organism is a parasite of a parasite. It's a fungus that parasitizes powdery mildew, which is a fungus in the order Aerosyphilis, which I have videos on my YouTube channel. In fact, I was pretty happy with a video I made recently where I talk about how powdery mildew came to be. It's called, Why is Powdery Mildew? And it's a good question because I think it's helped, it helps illustrate how pathogens can sort of come to be even from sort of neutral detrivores or even sort of beneficial fungi through either mutation or selective pressures or something like this. Uh, organisms can go from being mutualistic to parasitic pretty quickly. Anyways, my question, or my answer rather to this question, is that I think that it has a lot of um, potential. Though, to my knowledge, it's mostly used in uh, vineyards and uh, grapes and that sort of a thing, but I think there's a great potential for using this sort of hyperparasite against powdery mildews. The only drawback about it is that you can't really use it preventatively because, well, it needs the host to survive. It's a obligate parasite, not a baculative parasite, which means that it doesn't have like a non-parasitic lifestyle. It requires its host or it can't exist. There are a lot of um, parasites that are like this. So that's the only problem and drawback because I think most people would want to sort of prevent powdery mildew outright rather than wait for the pathogen to come into their area. But for a lot of people, even if they don't want this to happen, it does. So I think that this particular fungus can be useful in that way. April underscore 26 asks, 
if one is not able to positively ID a bug, is there any rules of thumb to help determine if a bug is beneficial or a pest? Yes, I would say that there are ways that you can arrive at that conclusion reasonably well, but there are a lot of tricks and arthropod identification in particular can be um, visually at least uh, impossible. There are plenty of organisms, several, arthro several arthropod groups that uh, without the aid of microscopy or even dissection or in some cases even genetic analysis, it's really hard to uh, parse the differences between the species and subgroups even, which is actually quite important because sometimes they're trying to find out like in the example for a silver leaf white fly, there are many different um, so-called biotypes and some of those biotypes have been quite a bit expanded in recent years because of our understanding of the genetics. So um, it becomes very important because certain biotypes have advantages like resistance to certain chemicals or they are less reproductive or more reproductive or they are associated with certain adaptations to certain environments and that sort of a thing. Generally speaking though, I would say that for the majority of cases, and I'm speaking very generally here, and there are many exceptions, if an arthropod is crawling on a plant or a crop plant of some kind and it's moving quite rapidly and you haven't disturbed it, I would say that it's typically not going to be herbivorous. This is because typically organisms like various insects that come across suitable hosts anyways are going to stay put and feed on that plant. They're either going to use chewing mouth parts to do this or they're going to use sucking mouth parts to do this. Now of course you would also find predatory arthropods who predate on the um, herbivorous arthropods in the same area and sometimes they have the same kind of mouth parts. They might have a sort of stylet that they use to pierce a uh, potential pest for us, like uh, aureus. There are predatory stink bugs, even though there are uh, many herbivorous stink bugs as well, and the difference between them are very slight for the layperson, and even for professionals for that matter. But generally speaking, arthropods that move quickly are looking to seek out or hunt um, something like an organism, rather than an herbivore that's likely to stay put on a plant. There are other examples as well, but it would require you to be familiar with um, various uh, bow planes and um, morphologies of insects and mites, which can happen over time through experience as well. April underscore 26 asks also, is there a way to safely transfer green lacewing eggs from one place to another? For those who don't know, green lacewings lay their eggs on a pedestal, a little hair, or really it's um, produced of a, um, a, of a structural compound from the lacewing, but they lay their eggs on these pedestals, and they do this because it protects them from potential predators and parasites that might uh, be moving around on the surface of like a leaf of some kind. Now to answer the question, I would say that yes, you could. You can either clip the pedestal and have the egg rest on some other structure, carry it somewhere else. Generally speaking though, I wouldn't do this. I would just let the um, larva uh, eclose from the egg and then move along and naturally find some prey because you can damage the egg if you remove it. Um, you also might, if you put it in a container, desiccate it. The natural humidity of the outdoor or indoor environment might be such that it would keep the egg um, from desiccating. But if you put it in a container and you don't have the proper humidity controls, then it can be problematic for the egg in question. This is true for a lot of eggs and also pupae for that matter. The chrysalises and cocoons of moths and butterflies, for example. Kelly underscore farms asks, Hey Mr. G, how about an episode on the bugs that are not considered harmful? Tyrophagus, springtails, etc. Do we eradicate them or control them? Are they seasonal? Etc. 
that's actually a really great question. It's not a, an IPM question, but it's a video request, and I am very happy to do this sort of a thing. Kelly Farms has a lot of cool questions, uh, and I've definitely enjoyed their correspondence in the past. I would say that there are questions, there are videos I already have on various organisms like are already mentioned. I have a video on mold mites and other soil mites that are no threat. That's actually the name of the video. Um, three soil mites that are no threat. And I talk about the um, mold mites, or what I call the mold mites. It's actually a very large group of various mites. I also talk about various soil predatory mites, like the Phytoceidae and the Lapidae. Although there are um, species that are not uh, soil bound in that way. They might travel up plants and down into the soil or they might only live in the soil or they might prefer the leaf litter or something like this. And then the third group that I talk about are the Oribatida or the Oribatid mites which are kind of like the mold mites too. I also have a video on springtails and what they are and sort of um, why they're not really a big problem even though they can reproduce quite uh, prolifically and they can be quite a concern or at least look like quite a concern to people. To be honest, I get more questions about mold mites and springtails, which are generally speaking neutral organisms for the vast majority of cases, than I do about uh, pests for that matter, or perhaps at this point a little bit equivalent. Soilborn Soldier asks on Instagram, Companion planting and cover crops, cannabis specifics, pros and cons of the most common pairings, or how about rhizosphere dwelling pests in different mediums, rock wool versus cocoa versus living soils versus expanded clay, who likes what, who doesn't exist in one but thrives in another? It's a pretty expansive question. It's a topic of conversation I might want to get some help on to explain different things about soil dynamics and soil chemistry and how um, sort of the pedosphere, which is the general sort of soil environment, influences like the rhizosphere and the rhizoplane and then the endosphere of plants and how bioturbators like um, uh, what we what we might call colloquially roly polies, pill bugs, sow bugs, earwigs, um, you know, various soil microarthropods and this sort of a thing, how they affect the uh, area around them, bioturbate, and have this sort of effect. I think that that would be helpful as well, in addition to understanding um, plant cover crops and what are the cons of um, different types of soil and other substrata because there are tons of substrates around that people use from cocoa to rock wool uh, like was already mentioned expanded clay living soil and that sort of a thing but there's so many differences it's very vast it would be very difficult to sort of condense it all down into one particular video i might have to do a whole series on it but it's a good video nonetheless because when you start to talk about all of these intricacies you start to understand how sophisticated and complex it all is and i think that allowing people to have a chance to have that experience and understand those intricacies as best as we do now uh, can be very enriching so i really appreciate that question sir underscore vase underscore a asks on instagram how long does sulfur last when mixed with water? It's a good question. Sulfur will last quite a long time in water, but in my experience, it's better to, if you're trying to mix sulfur in um, for as a pesticide or as some sort of a um, amendment, uh, it's better to not let it sit for too long. For one thing, sulfur volatizes even without water and I would be very concerned about the safety of dissolving sulfur into water and letting it sit for too long. If it spills, it might be problematic. Um, sulfur, for those who don't know, is not as toxic dermally, but it is toxic to our, well, it's 
bad for our mucous membranes. It's toxic if we inhale it quite a bit, actually, and it can be very irritating to some people's skin. Some people are quite sensitive more than others. Your mucosal areas, so your near your eyes, your nose, your mouth, um, various other orifices are also going to be sensitive to sulfur. So leaving it out or, or leaving it contained in a mixed state uh, for too long, I think, maybe represents a bit of a hazard. Uh, but other than that, um, it would last pretty long. I know that's not a very good answer, but I don't really have the best answer at the moment. It would depend on how much sulfur you're using and a lot of other factors. It can be hard to answer questions in this way because, well, sometimes the answer is it's complex. And in this case, I think it would depend on how much sulfur and how long you're expecting it to last. But I would say it would last for at least a few days, maybe even a couple of weeks. But whether or not it will be efficacious for what you're trying to use it for, uh, that will depend on what you're trying to use it for. 423 is asked on Instagram, what's the best predatory bug that kills russet mites? Thanks. Good question. There is not a whole lot of research on russet mite biocontrol. For one thing, just to get out of the way, despite their reputation in the cannabis industry, the citrus industry, the aloe industry, uh, most russet mites, as far as we can tell, are not pestiferous. They are what we call uh, vagrant pests sometimes, in that they don't cause a whole lot of damage to their hosts. The Areophyidae in general are actually specialists. Uh, they generally only feed on one species or a group of related species. Um, they don't typically have um, a generalistic uh, feeding behavior. They generally move on air currents, actually, as well as on fomites like equipment and clothing and other animals for that matter. I've even seen hemp russet mites, Aculops cannabicola, on the cannabis aphid, Forodon cannabis, and I have a video of that on my Forodon cannabis pest primer video. So if you're interested in that, for what's called foracy, which is when uh, one organism sort of carries another organism on it uh, intentionally or unintentionally. That's called a foretic movement and that can be very problematic from an IPM perspective because you want to prevent that as much as possible and despite not having wings, russet mites are able to move on the wind current because they're so small, air is a fluid medium and is like a less dense ocean in that way. So russet mites, the physics of aerodynamics for russet mites and a lot of other smaller arthropods uh, is very different than it is for larger organisms like humans and that sort of a thing. But as far as things that kill russet mites, russet mites have uh, a few different options. I have a video on my YouTube channel that goes over predatory mites that feed on russet mites and in my personal experience, russet mites can be taken out uh, in cannabis context at least with um, Amblyceus scorsii, Neocilius cucumerus, and those are the two main ones that I like to use. They're pretty comparable. There are some slight differences between the two, but generally speaking, those are the best examples that I have, uh, particularly in cannabis. Um, there are citrus russet mites in citriculture, and there are aloe russet mites in aloe culture, I suppose you would say. And in those cases, the advice that I've always gotten and that I've always understood to be the case from extension agents and that sort of a thing is that uh, you would have to use some sort of noxious chemical, usually. Um, in the case of aloe, I've gotten the advice that uh, you should just remove the plants that have russets and um, that's the easiest way to prevent a large outbreak. They're very pestiferous, um, those particular species that affect our crops. But the vast majority of russet mites are actually not this way, um, so it's sort of an unfortunate bit of luck that 
there are certain pest species that go after our crops and damage them in the way that they do. But yeah, check out my video on the predatory mites that go after russet mites that are pests and I go over some experiments in that video uh, that lend credence to those predatory mites being applicable, whereas other predatory mites are not applicable, either because they just don't feed on that particular kind of mite, or for whatever reason they can't reproduce on that particular mite, which is a big part of biocontrol efficacy, because if they don't, um, if they don't, if they aren't able to reproduce um, increasingly well on the, the host species, then they will not be very efficacious because they won't be able to outpace the population increase of the pest itself. So that's a very important part. Also, how many they can feed on and what their reproductive ability is in the particular crop itself, because that can change as well. So check it out. Dr. Underscore Logan Underscore L dot S on Instagram asks, how to select against some phylons in beds raised or in ground? Which cover plants might help specific microbiology requirements, predators, bugs, etc.? Some phylons are very arduous to deal with. For those who don't know, some phylons are a sort of um, centipede esque arthropod. Um, I conceptually, all the time, get them mixed up with uh, web spinners, which are also subterranean hypogeal organisms um, that are a nuisance because they feed on uh, roots and they also feed on other organic matter and that sort of a thing. But symphylins are a huge problem. and. I think that it's very difficult in the uh, context of an IPM back like this to answer this question, but I'll do you one better. I'll make a video about some phylons instead because that might be helpful for a bunch of different reasons. Might give some context as to why they're so difficult and in the uh, time span that they have to answer the question. So this is a great question because it gives me good content to produce and I'm always looking for good content to produce. So I will get back to this question. I will get back to it with uh, hopefully a better answer and um, specifically talk about these uh, few different contexts like beds versus raised beds, what are some cover plants that might help and uh, whether there's a sort of soil microbiome um, response that can be facilitated. All these are great questions, but I will leave this um, for people who are growing in gardens and that sort of a thing, that it might be possible to um, destroy a local population through, unfortunately, tilling or using a tarp and that sort of a thing to sort of um, uh, bake the uh, surface soil, but there are obviously big drawback <laughs> there are drawbacks to this sort of system uh, and solution because if you're trying to grow your soil microbiome and cultivate it um, consistently and constantly, then this sort of treatment will become uh, problematic for obvious reasons. But um, I will get back to this question with a much better answer. Hopefully. Slug underscore asks on Instagram, how can you prevent bugs from entering the indoor grow space when building it? Great question. I often say that uh, physical barriers are some of the best uh, returns on investment when it comes to IPM. And it's one of the reasons why I say that preventative movements in IPM are so much more important. And especially if you can construct a facility from the ground up, you're not just inheriting a, sol a solution or a uh, facility, you are creating your solutions at the onset. Um, mesh screening is a very helpful barrier. Various um, insect uh, mesh screens can be very useful because a lot of your big pests are going to be quite small your thrips, your white flies, your mites, like I've mentioned earlier, um, all of those organisms, in one way or another, will travel on the air, 
or they will travel on other things that might pass through the netting. But if they're in the local space, they will have a much tougher time getting through a mesh screen that is too small for them. It will be impossible or close to being impossible for them to penetrate unless there's a rip or a tear in that screen. Um, walls that are not permeable at all are obviously also helpful for keeping things out if you're in a sort of an indoor environment. You can also have some effect with um, creating windbreak. Um, I know people who make use of sort of walled structures to keep uh, wind from directly getting uh, blown into their uh, into the entrances of their indoor areas or even their fields. Some people even plant uh, rows of trees to act as a natural wind barrier and this can be effective for a number of reasons because it essentially keeps the wind, which is itself a vector, from bringing in a lot of weak flying insects like thrips for example and aphids for that matter. Uh, another thing that you can do for preventing insects from getting in is the use of positive pressure. Um, if you have an indoor facility and you are using positive pressure, that means that the air is being pushed out of the room and that means that dust and other small particulates are not going to be easily moved into the room if they're kind of in the ambient airspace, if that makes sense. There are a bunch of other things that you can do um, to prevent organisms from entering into an indoor space, but uh, a bunch of walls and barriers are a big help. You can also, of course, use disinfecting uh, tools for your uh, shoes, Obviously, changing your clothes is a big aspect of keeping things hygienic. Um, wearing gloves is always uh, preferential. Um, having aprons and sort of a, a hygiene culture that accounts for that is also very useful. But it's important to note that if you don't utilize these hygiene products effectively, then you will not reap the rewards of it. If you, for example, use a apron and glove combination when going into a cultivation space indoors and you start with the most infested area first when you're checking it out and then you move to the least infected area, then you're going to move, you're much more likely at least to take infested uh, plant material um, from one area to another or those organisms themselves from the highly infested area to the lower infested area. So in that way, what I term, um, and not uniquely for that matter, cultural controls or the way that you actually do things can incredibly uh, facilitate and modulate uh, other aspects of IPM. Your, bio, your biological controls, your chemical controls, your genetic controls, your uh, mechanical, what I call mechanical controls, or even sometimes environmental controls as well. Um, a barrier isn't very useful if there, you know, aren't other sorts of um, aspects of the system to make it really useful. Because indeed, if you can just bypass the barrier itself, um, then it really doesn't matter. This is how pathogens get into the wounds of plants and animals for that matter. And it's also true in IPM. So when it comes down to it, having a good standard operating procedure, having good hygiene, and having a very good physical barriers, in fact, uh, multiple redundancies with your uh, barrier space can offer you quite a bit in the way of prevention. Cascadian Grown, who I've also uh, heard from on Instagram quite a bit and have enjoyed uh, correspondence with, asks, I would love to see a series about the husbandry of the beneficials used frequently to combat the most frequent of pests. How to raise predatory mites, lacewings, nematodes, etc. I get asked this question a lot in some way or another, and to be quite honest, I'm a huge advocate of the 
the production or the facilitation of biocontrol agents in in a in a growth space in a cultural uh, or in a cultivation context rather. Um, it's difficult though to quantify this sort of a thing. Oftentimes, the reason why insectaries are useful for the way that they are is because it often requires um, technical work usually requires a lot of precision and it often requires um, quite a bit of scale um, at least if you're supplying these arthropods and other organisms to um, various places uh, it requires technical staff and, and lots of money but on a smaller scale there are a lot of things that can be done to sort of um, have like a smaller version of this uh, one of which is sort of banker plants. Um, and I think that I will make such a series in the future. It's a really good idea. But sort of to answer the question for those who are um, interested in this sort of subject, there are a few things people can do. I've already mentioned banker plants. You can have, for example, pollen resources for your omnivorous biocontrol agents, which would include, for those who don't know, um, so, your Arias, so your Arias minute pirate bugs, uh, they feed on pollen. Rips also feed on pollen, or at least many of them do, so you have to be aware of that. Um, there are also predatory mites that are omnivorous. Some of them are specialists, like Phytocytes persimilis and um, uh, various other arthropods. Um, there's a very important video or a series of videos that I've made on YouTube that talk about the various biocontrol or rather acarine or mite biocontrol uh, agents. Um, there are also uh, the phytoceidae who I've already mentioned and there are a lot of biocontrol species that come from this family. And some of them are what we call type 1, which means they're specialized on spider mites. And some of them are type 3 or type 4, which are more generalist and omnivorous. A lot of those omnivores also feed on pollen. So your predatory mites, your orias, those feed on pollen. If you can create banker plants that have lots of pollen, then you can have this beneficial effect. Unfortunately, not all pollen is created equally, or at least fortunately for the plants that are having the pollen eaten in the natural world. Some pollen is quite toxic to uh, various arthropods, and I've got videos that kind of show how pollen can both be a boon um, for predatory mites because it helps them uh, resist the negative effects of uh, ultraviolet radiation, which is great and has um, beneficial nutritional value as well. But it can also have negative effects if it's poisonous, of course. So be careful with what plants you utilize. Um, predatory mites tend to be much more fecund. In fact, uh, Ambosius swirskii is like three times more fecund um, on a purely pollen diet, if you can believe it. Uh, much more than on a mixed prey or pollen diet. Uh, in tandem, which is kind of surprising to me actually. So having a uh, banker system uh, for these omnivores is one example of many that can be used to facilitate uh, biocontrol agents in an area, but it's also important to be able to attract them. Uh, the, one of the defining characteristics of insects is that they fly. So for the vast majority of insects in their adult form, they can fly. Some insects have lost its ability, like fleas, for example. But, um, so to attract them, obviously you need something uh, that is attractive, and a lot of times that would be a floral resource, like for hoverflies and the Syrphidae, which feed on nectar and pollen as adults. Um, at least a lot of them do. There's a, it's a very diverse group. Um, the larvae feed on some of them uh, decaying sort of like organic matter in aquatic systems. Some of them feed on uh, rotting wood. Some of them, however, feed on aphids, and those are the ones that you are going to want to attract. 
uh, with flowers, like alyssum, for example. Um, but depending on your region and area, you'll have a ton of natural biocontrol agents, hopefully, that uh, you will become aware of as you study them and uh, become more aware of them in your general area. That's why it's always important to identify um, arthropods and other organisms that you're just not familiar with. You might find that it's actually a beneficial organism, not a pest. It sort of kills me every time that somebody asks me if an organism was good or bad after they've uh, killed it, and I have to tell them that in fact it was a beneficial organism and sort of a sad moment, but they usually bounce back and they learn from the experience. So I think this is a great idea, and shout out to Cascadian Grown for asking uh, for such a comprehensive and really important series. Hopefully there will be enough research where people can uh, be able to do it on a smaller scale, and I quite a bit advocate for it. The Jolly Green Grower on Instagram asks, Best way to balance having beneficial predators and other IPM methods like spraying? I mean, this is sort of hard to answer without context. It's really uh, impossible to answer without context. A lot of questions in this life uh, do require quite a bit of context to give a precise and uh, very useful answer. Some of the best ways to sort of balance uh, biocontrol application and facilitation, kind of like in the last question, is to um, not apply noxious chemistries. Um, being aware of which chemistries you're using and what they do is very important, both on a residential and a commercial scale. Um, indeed, in some cases, residential gardens uh, have access to noxious compounds that uh, commercial growers balk at using or simply don't have the luxury of being able to use. For example, um, there are pyrethrins, which are natural chemistries, um, what well, is a natural uh, group of compounds rather. Uh, there are various pyrethrins, but pyrethrin generally is considered to be uh, fine and non-toxic, or very low toxic, I should say, to like mammals. But it's a neurotoxin to insects, and what it does is it, um, it causes their muscles to sort of stay on uh, and not, and not uh, cycle between on and off, like uh, the way that your heart functions, for example and that starts to become very problematic very quickly and they um, are unable to move or feed and they die soon afterwards. Um, so if you're using a pyrethrin uh, against a pest, it might be negative against your arthropods, but insects uh, are very similar to other arthropods like mites, but they aren't exactly the same. And so certain chemistries might be insecticidal, whereas others would be mitocidal. So it's important to know what chemistries you're using and whether or not they are, for one, toxic to yourself, toxic to your plants that you're growing, toxic to various biocontrol agents that you're either utilizing because you're buying them commercially or because you're facilitating them from your natural environment. Um, when you do apply uh, safe uh, compounds like you know, soaps and uh, biopesticides, uh, it's important to know whether or not those biopesticides will negatively, negatively affect the target, um, but also sort of um, whether they're broad spectrum or not. Earlier I referenced uh, Blueberry Bastiana. I really like it because it's a broad spectrum entomopathogenic fungus. But what I also don't like about it is as a broad spectrum entomopathogenic fungus. What do I mean? Well, because if you over apply it or you apply it too much or in the wrong places, you might kill things that you didn't intend to kill. And generally speaking, that's not good. Uh, it's not great for the environment to do that sort of a thing. So it's really important that if you do apply biocontrol agents that you don't apply a spray application that will affect them negatively. Um, in some cases you can get around this, like with Blueberia, by applying it first and then applying the biocontrols afterwards or applying in spot sprays only to hot spots so that you don't um, 
take out a large section of a biocontrol population or community. Organics CA asks on Instagram, what kind or size of netting would work to keep moths from laying eggs on cannabis? Pretty much any screen for that matter. Various moths are small. Um, some of them are quite large, uh, especially in different parts of the world, but generally speaking, most insect screen is way, way, way too small for the vast majority of moths to get through. I don't even think that some of the micro moths can get through some insect screens, so you're probably fine with um, trips screen for sure. And you might as well get something that's really small because it'll have advantages not just for the moths, but also for other insects as well and other arthropods like mites. So in my opinion, uh, most netting would be very useful for this purpose. Space Dog Select asks on Instagram, how many different kinds of root aphids are there? This is a good question. There are various root aphids, but the ones that I'm the most familiar with are in the Pemphigony group. The tribe Pemphigony, um, not all of the species are root aphids, but several of them are. And it's kind of hard to answer this question because if because there's no group that is called the root aphids and they're all in this one group. Um, what you're really asking is how many aphids have a hypogeal or subterranean um, lifestyle. And although it is the case in a lot of situations where you might have like a basal ancestor of a particular group of maybe insects uh, that maybe has a special trait like maybe it is underground or it's subterranean and that all of the divergent lineages um, from that uh, ancestral base might also be subterranean. Maybe a few of them revert to being um, uh, superterranean or um, above ground. Uh, but in the case of aphids, I believe that uh, living on roots is something that has um, developed in multiple uh, lineages, essentially. So they're not all in one specific lineage. The rice root aphid, Ropalocyphum rufia dominale, is the most famous root aphid that I can think of, especially in cannabis um, and other sorts of crops. And it's in the Macrosophini group, which a lot of aphids are in. Um, there are other species that are related to the rice root aphid, uh, sister species, and that sort of a thing, like the water lily aphid, um, and others. And, well, for the water lily aphid, it's semi-aquatic for that matter, so it's not um, subterranean, it's subaquatic. And um, that plays into sort of like what it's allowed to do, how it's developed over millions of years, and that sort of a thing. Blue Sky underscore organics on Instagram asks, How's your day going? My day is going pretty well. I try to be as productive as possible with the time that I have, which is why I'm making these videos like I am, because I think that they're a great reference for people and I genuinely enjoy making them, although they do take quite a bit of time. Um, I'll probably always try to make this sort of information available to people, so. But as far as my day is going, I have to say I don't have many complaints. Nate L on my YouTube commentary question about this exact video and what questions people would like to see asks, I was wondering what you do for ants. I use sugar and borax. How do you combat broad mites? I was wondering what you would do if you had root aphids. I would appreciate to know how you did any of those. Thank you kindly. That's actually three questions in one, but it's no problem. Several of these I've already answered in one way or another on my YouTube channel or in these very questions themselves. For ants, it's actually quite nuanced because anyone who knows um, a bit about ants might be aware that not all ants are created the same and many ants feed on many different kinds 
things. So you can't always use the same sort of bait or the same sort of uh, resource as a lure. Um, a lot of ants are going to be attracted to the sugar, of course, and borax does work against a lot of different ants, but it won't work against all ants in that way. The blueberry bassiana that I mentioned earlier uh, is one thing that I think is really great against ants. Especially if you inoculate like a bait with the uh, blueberry bassiana, then they feed on it, they take it to their nest, they become infected, and it moves very quickly through a very closely spaced uh, environment uh, because that's the nature of parasitic pathogens. They do really good in um, closed spaces with many, many individuals that they can infect. Um, this is why ants and other social organisms have um, very highly adapted uh, hygiene responses to pathogens and uh, vectors of pathogens like dead bodies, for example. As for broad mites, I do have a video about broad mite killers on my YouTube channel. Uh, many of these um, are predatory mites. I already mentioned some that go after russet mites, but they also go after broad mites, and that's the Amblyceus sworskii, the Neocilius cucumerus. Um, I've heard people say that uh, Neocilius californicus works on broad mites as well, but I haven't had that experience myself. Um, and it's also a sort of a, I think it's a type 2 predatory mite. Um, in the McMurtry report that I have a video on that goes over the different types of various predatory mites in the Phytoceidae. And I've already mentioned uh, rice root aphids in the past, but um, one of the ways to actually treat rice root aphids is to use, again, Blueberry Bassiana. You're going to think that I'm a shill for the people who make Blueberry Bassiana by the end of this video, I feel like, but it's actually not the case. Blueberry Bassiana is my experience really good for rice root aphids. Um, the key to using this enzyme pathogen is spores on contact. The more spores you get on the target that aren't washed away or anything like this, the more efficacious it's going to be. And since it is itself a uh, soil-borne pathogen typically, and it can endophytically colonize plants, which means that it can move inside of plant tissue and move systemically in plant tissue to a limited degree, um, depending on how uh, well it is able to colonize, and this is uh, controlled by various factors like what plant we're talking about, the particular uh, strain of the fungus itself, and a bunch of other factors um, related to the context of the cultivation space. But if I had rice root aphids, I would use that. Um, I might be I might consider using uh, a dip of blueberry bassiana um, in, in vegetation uh, where I don't have to worry about fruits or um, uh, like cannabis flower material, that sort of a thing, then I would not want to spray really anything on them if they got into the uh, higher echelons of the plants. Um, but rice root aphids are a big problem in uh, cannabis, which is probably the reason why I'm getting this question, so I wanted to articulate that particular thought there. My friend Jack Greenstalk on my YouTube commentary question asks, is there a safe relative humidity percentage or vapor pressure deficit range powdery mildew will not infect cannabis plants? I see some claim in 40% relative humidity range it makes you safe, but I feel airflow, VPD, general plant health, genetic resistance, and soil biology, etc. all play a role on powdery mildew ability to infect a plant. Curious if there is data behind when it commonly overtakes a plant versus when it doesn't show up. So this is a good question, and I do talk about powdery mildew in my Golovinomyces sicariserum video on lettuce powdery mildew, which, for those who don't know, uh, is confirmed to infest cannabis plants. Um, also lettuce, also a bunch of other different plants. The name is a little bit misleading in that way. 
but lettuce pottery mildew um, in that video is kind of a general, well, the, event, the answers I give are sort of um, generalizable to a lot of different pottery mildew species. But essentially, powdery mildew does best in a more humid environment. A lot of fungi do. Um, what happens though is that the spores will um, sporulate when the humidity changes rapidly and dramatically. So if it's a certain level of humidity and the humidity changes very rapidly from like dry to humid, then that can cause a reaction in the plant. Suffice it to say, if you have powdery mildew spores in your area on a plant uh, leaf surface or something like this, a dramatic shift between uh, sort of a drier percentage to a uh, less dry percentage, so a more humid percentage, will cause the spores to um, break open and sort of activate essentially. And once that's already happened, the relative humidity doesn't really matter. Um, and indeed, there is relative humidity and there is absolute humidity, which is a much more precise thing. And different microclimates uh, around a plant will have various different um, humidity levels. So, for example, just because the relative humidity might be 60%, it might be 80% um, near a leaf or underneath a leaf or closer to the um, soil level, something like this. So it's important to know this when it comes to sort of the uh, epidemiology of powdery mildews. Generally speaking, all of the points that Jack already mentioned are a really great example of all the different factors associated with infection that I think are much more important than humidity because we're really only talking about spores when they sporulate. After that, the humidity doesn't really matter because they've already started the parasitic process and once they can parasitize the tissue, then they are able to uh, reproduce and make more um, conidia, which are the asexual spores of powdery mildew. Windy City Garden on YouTube asks, This may be an impossible question to answer, but I have an outdoor cannabis crop and I'm trying to prepare for late season pests. I'm thinking about adding beneficial insects, assassin bugs, and maybe a friendly mite to limit chemicals on the buds. Is there a list of late season pests I should be thinking about? Or how do you think a combo of an assassin bug and a mite would do in terms of knocking back pests? Another great question about biocontrol agents. So I have a few opinions that I want to share briefly. Essentially, the assassin bugs will be good against caterpillars and larger pest organisms, but they won't do very much at all, um, except as nymphs, when they're smaller at least, against some of the more pestiferous uh, pests that I've mentioned that are uh, microarthropods um, that are quite small. Your thrips, your white flies, your russet mice, which are like two micro 200 rather micrometers long, um, predatory mites will be able to go after those a little bit easier, but late season pests sort of is not, um, it, it's not detailed enough to know exactly what you're dealing with. Um, everybody's situation is different, every cultivation context is different, and globally it would be important for me to know the area and become familiar with that location and the pests that are in that area um, to really render the best advice. So although it might be impossible to ask or rather answer this question comprehensively, um, I can give you some ideas. Generally speaking, in a lot of places, um, you have your you have moths that come out, um, or or rather you have caterpillars that pupate. A lot of organisms will enter sort of a diapause or a torpor, some sort of hibernation-like behavior uh, during autumn, uh, late summer and autumn, you know, to overwinter. So there are pests that 
uh, won't be a problem until the springtime when they're adults and they either lay eggs or uh, come out to feed on the plants uh, once again, or both. I think that predatory mites would be great in uh, the late season no matter what, partly because establishing them in your crop area would be great as a, as a matter of course but you might not have as much efficacious uh, effect with the assassin bugs um, to that extent. I do like the idea of using biocontrol agents to sort of avoid using chemical agents, and indeed in some cases biocontrols can be really great for this. Predatory mites are a good example of this, and I um, heartily support that somebody uses the Amblyssia swirskii and the Neosis cumerus that I have mentioned several times as answers in this um, question and answer series, as well as uh, right here. Uh, Lelaphidae, uh, Phytoceidae, there's a bunch of species that are omnivorous that you can establish and keep around, in fact, throughout the entire year. Um, assassin bugs, you know, I'd have to know which assassin bug species and whether they're sort of natural or if you're getting them commercially in some capacity. So it really does depend in that way. But it's a very good question. Gage Oakley on YouTube asks, I have a psychidy bagworm problem. I'm looking at spraying Bacillus thuringiensis. Any pro tips? I don't actually have a lot of experience with controlling bagworms or uh, family psychidy. Um, I do know that bagworms can be a problem if you let them become a problem. What I mean to say is that it can often be useful to uh, scout plants that um, uh, are affected by bagworms. I don't know exactly what species is being um, talked about in this uh, context, which would be useful to know because uh, not all bagworms are the same. Um, I know people who use sort of um, uh, soaps uh, as sort of a contact killer, as a suffocant. Um, I know that if you scout your trees and then you preventively destroy bagworms that you come across, if this is a commercial setting, then certain aspects are going to be much more arduous and laborious, whereas in sort of like a residential setting, this might be a little bit easier to do. Of course, some trees are going to be quite large and it would be difficult for you to scale the entire tree <laughs> looking for these bagworms and that sort of a thing. Um, as far as Bacillus thuringiensis is concerned, I think there could be some effect there because um, as long as you're using the uh, the uh, Kurostaki strain, uh, which is for caterpillars in particular, um, then you might have some great effect there. However, um, Bacillus thuringiensis has other different isolates. So there are, for example, there's the Kurosaki, there is um, Israeliensis, there are a few others as well. And they're all made, or rather, they're developed to be good for certain insects over others. So make sure you're using the right Bacillus thuringiensis when you are using it. And that's all of my questions. Um, hopefully, I got to all of the questions. In fact, I'm pretty sure that I did because I'm quite fastidious about this kind of a thing. When I say, give me your questions, I'm going to answer your questions. And hopefully, um, that will always be the case. It might not always be the case, but I'm always honored that people want to at least get some information from me and that I can provide that information for them as a conduit to that knowledge. So, if I answered your question, let me know if that was an appropriate response and if you would like more information because, I mean, I'd be happy to give you some more. And um, if you found it helpful, please let me know as well because it is a fulfilling process for me and I do like to know that I've actually answered the questions that people ask me appropriately. And if this information was useful to you that you didn't answer or ask any of these questions, please let me know. And um, I'd be interested in fielding more questions. In fact, I'll probably do a video like this every month. I think this will be the July video for 2020. And I will have 
another um, poll on my Instagram, which is at Saint Angel, my Twitter, which is also uh, twitter.com slash uh, Angel, as well as Zenthanol. I have a Twitter account for myself and also for Zenthanol, the uh, a consulting group that I've created, and also on YouTube. On YouTube, I can actually make a community post where people can respond as well, which is where I got these questions from that are displayed currently. So, if you have questions, look forward to another IPM FAQ in August. I look forward to seeing those questions and more to come.